Good evening. Welcome to South Asia Newsline. I'm Yeshi Chonsa. Here are the top stories we're tracking for you on Thursday, the 3rd of March. India's Foreign Minister briefs Parliamentary Panel on Russia-Ukraine war evacuation efforts. U.S. concerned over presence of terror outfits in Pakistan says top official. And fertilizer ban decimates Sri Lankan crops as government popularity ebbs. And now for all the details. India's Foreign Minister S.J. Shankar on Thursday briefed a parliamentary panel on the prevailing situation in the wake of Russia-Ukraine war that has entered the 8th day and the massive operation Ganga to evacuate stranded Indians. Jashankar said a strong and unanimous message of support was shared for intensified efforts to bring back all Indians from Ukraine, while its airspace remains shut. Indian Foreign Minister S. Jashankar on Thursday briefed a parliamentary panel on the prevailing situation in war-torn Ukraine and massive Operation Ganga to evacuate stranded nationals. In a series of tweets, Jay Shankar informed discussions were held on the strategic and humanitarian aspects of the issue, and a strong and unanimous message of support was shared for efforts to bring back all Indians from Ukraine, he said. Congress leader Shashi Tharoor said the opposition stands united with the government's stance. This comes as India has intensified its efforts to evacuate its citizens from neighboring countries of Ukraine while the airspace remains shut. About a dozen evacuation flights, including Air Force aircraft carrying mostly students, landed in different parts of the country on Thursday. The returnees shared their journey of escape from Ukraine was full of challenges. <laughs> So, until then, the air base, uh, air so, it was not possible to get out of air flights. So, that's why it was very difficult for us. After the border, the border is good, the conditions are good. The street is good, but until the border is not going to cross, the conditions are very bad. India's Foreign Ministry spokesperson on Thursday debunked claims that Indian students were being held hostage in Ukraine after Russian Defence Ministry said Ukrainian authorities were forcibly keeping them in Kharkiv. Russia also claimed it had captured Kherson city amid intensified assaults on key Ukrainian cities. Polling for the sixth phase of the ongoing assembly elections in India's most populous Uttar Pradesh state was held on Thursday. Uttar Pradesh Chief Minister Yogi Adityanath also cast his vote in his constituency Gorakhpur and exuded confidence that the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party will retain power, sweeping over 80% of seats. Polling was held across 10 districts in the sixth phase of the ongoing assembly elections in India's most populous Uttar Pradesh state on Thursday. Uttar Pradesh, home to more than 200 million people, is a bellwether of national politics and is currently ruled by Prime Minister Narendra Modi's BJP, the Bharatiya Janata Party. Its main contenders are Samajwadi Party, Rashtra Lokdal Alliance and the Congress Party. The state's chief minister, Yogi Adityanath, a Hindu monk, also cast his vote in Gorakhpur on Thursday and said he was confident BJP will win over 80 seats in the Legislative Assembly. यहां पे बिजली की समस्या है यहां पे जितने भी तार है पोल यहां पे स्ट्रीट लाइट बहुत खराब है पूरा तार जर्जर हो चुका है यहां पे यहां पे सफाई की व्यवस्था नहीं है सही से Meanwhile ahead of the seventh phase of polling Prime Minister Modi addressed a public rally in Chandoli district and urged voters that BJP's poll victory was necessary to ensure continued development of the state the seventh phase polling in Uttar Pradesh will conclude on March 7 and counting of votes will begin on March 10 Moving on, Donald Liu, a senior U.S. administration official on Wednesday, told lawmakers that Washington is concerned over the continued presence of terrorist organizations like lashkar e taiba and jaish e mohammed in Pakistan. He said the country is working with Islamabad to encourage it to fully dismantle and prosecute the members of such outfits. 
The U.S. is concerned over the continued presence of terrorist organizations in Pakistan and is working with Islamabad to encourage it to fully dismantle and prosecute the members of such outfits. Donald Liu, Assistant Secretary of State for South and Central Asia, told members of the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on Wednesday. According to a Congressional Research Service report on terrorism, Pakistan is home to at least 12 groups designated as foreign terrorist organizations like the L.E.T. lashkar e taiba and J.E.M. jaish e Mohammed. The L.E.T. founded by Hafiz Saeed in 1980s is responsible for carrying out the 2008 Mumbai attacks in India as well as numerous other high-profile attacks. The J.E.M. was founded in 2000 by Masood Azhar and was designated as a foreign terrorist organization in 2001. Along with L.E.T., it was responsible for the 2001 attack on the Indian parliament, among other attacks. We have seen real progress forward in um, prosecution of leaders of these groups, dismantling of some of these groups, but as you point out, these groups still remain, and we are working with Pakistan to encourage them to fully dismantle uh, and to prosecute members of these terrorist organizations. Lu said India continues to report infiltration by militants from Pakistan into its Jammu and Kashmir, although rates of it have reduced markedly since the 2019 Pulwama attack in which 40 Indian soldiers were killed. This comes as fate of Pakistan hangs in the balance as Paris-based Financial Action Task Force is holding meetings this week to assess its actions. While it has remained on FATF's grey list since 2018 for failing to effectively prosecute UN-designated terror outfits. Days after Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan announced a cut in petrol and diesel prices by rupees 10 per litre, the oil marketing companies and refineries have warned the government of fuel crisis in the country. Holding a meeting with the petroleum division, all marketing companies expressed serious concerns and questioned the mechanism of fuel price adjustment. Pakistan's oil marketing companies and refineries have warned the government of a brewing fuel crisis in the country after Prime Minister Imran Khan in a surprising move announced to cut in petrol and diesel prices by Rs 10 litre this week. In response, a virtual meeting between OGRA, the Oil and Gas Regulatory Authority, and the Petroleum Division was held in Islamabad, in which oil marketing companies expressed serious concerns and questioned the mechanism of fuel price adjustment while global prices remain high. Prime Minister Khan's move came at a time when the opposition parties have mounted pressure on his PTI-led government by holding an anti-inflation long march and warned of no confidence motion in the parliament. According to a statement issued by the Finance Division, the global petroleum products prices have surged to 100 US dollars per barrel amid the Ukraine-Russian war. The impact of Rs 10 per litre reduction in fuel prices would mean the monthly impact of about Rs 15 billion, based on average sales of about 1.5 billion litres, reports suggest. Six months after the Taliban took over Afghanistan, it is time for concerned countries to deepen their engagement with the country's new authorities and take action to prevent an irreversible economic collapse. UN envoy to Kabul, Deborah Alliance, told the Security Council on Wednesday. UN Secretary General's Special Representative and Head of the UN Mission in Afghanistan, Deborah Alliance, told the Security Council on Wednesday that humanitarian agencies may have distributed enough aid in Afghanistan to avert famine and large-scale starvation, but the country's economic collapse is approaching a point of irreversibility. Lyons said that it is most urgent to resolve the root problems of the economic crisis, but doing so will require cooperating on all issues with the Taliban, who seized power in August. The urgent steps must be taken to address the liquidity crisis, restrictions on international payments, and constraints on the central bank, she added. I want to start by emphasizing that we are nearing a tipping point, that we'll see more businesses close, more people unemployed and falling into poverty. It is approaching a point of irreversibility. 
The Taliban authorities lack international recognition six months after overrunning Kabul as the last US-led international troops departed, ending 20 years of war. Donors cut financial aid constituting more than 70% of government expenditures and about 9 billion US dollars in Afghan central bank assets were frozen. Many Taliban leaders remain under US and UN sanctions. The moves accelerated an economic collapse fueling a cash shortage, joblessness and hunger, prompting UN warnings that more than half of the 39 million people face the starvation. In news from Sri Lanka. Farmers in Sri Lanka reel from the impact of chemical fertilizer ban that was imposed by President Gotabaya Rajpaksa as part of efforts to promote healthier agricultural practices and make farming more sustainable. Despite the ban reversal, only a trickle of chemical fertilizers made it to farms, which will likely lead to an annual drop of at least 30% in paddy yields nationwide, according to agricultural experts. In eastern Sri Lanka's Agbapura village, one recent morning, farmer W.M. Sene Viratne said watching a mechanized harvester slice through the jade green fields around him, aware that this year's harvest would be only a fraction of what he was used to. 65-year-old Sene Viratne has been farming since he was a child. <laughs> Nothing. According to Indika Paranavithana, head of the local farmers' association, farmers like Sene Viratne, who used to harvest around 30 to 35 paddy bags per acre, have had their return come down to 15 bags. The dramatic fall in yields follows a decision last April by President Gotabaya Rajpaksa to ban the use and importation of all chemical fertilizers in Sri Lanka as part of efforts to promote healthier agricultural practices and make farming more sustainable. However, the government rode back on the move later, removing the ban after months of mass protests by farmers and a surge in food price inflation. Despite the ban reversal, only a trickle of chemical fertilizers made it to farms, which will likely lead to an annual drop of at least 30% in paddy yields nationwide, according to agricultural experts. To ease the hit on consumers, Rajpaksa's administration is importing rice using credit lines from friendly neighbours. And to help farmers, it has raised the minimum government purchase price and announced a 40 billion Sri Lankan rupee, that is 200 million US dollars compensation package. But many farmers say they do not know when and how government compensation would reach them. Moving on, celebrations of Loser Festival, the Lunar New Year of Buddhist community, began in India on Friday. Monks and devotees offered prayers in Dharamsala and Shimla cities on the occasion. Devotees sent out a message of peace, love and harmony through this festival. Buddhist community across India on Friday marked the beginning of Lunar New Year, Loser and welcomed the year of the Water Tiger 2149. Adorned in their traditional dresses, Tibetans in northern hill town of Dharamshala gathered outside the Sukla Ka temple, which reopened after being shut for two years owing to COVID-19 pandemic to offer prayers and celebrate the festival with their family and loved ones. Buddhist monks led the prayer inside the temple. Likewise, Buddhist monks in Shimla's Dorji Dak monastery marked the festival by offering prayers for world peace and prosperity of sentient beings. Prayers on the occasion are performed to dispel the evils of the previous year and bring good luck for the coming year. But we have to pray puja to all the sentient beings, good uh, benefit to all sentient beings and especially the, uh, uh, our, uh, all the uh, Buddhism lineage throne holders 
Lhasa celebration is one of the most festive periods of the year, observed with a lot of religious, cultural and merry-making events for a week or two by Buddhists. It marks the end of winter and the beginning of spring. Well, that's all we have for you from South Asia this evening. Now, our viewers can watch the show on SouthAsianewsline.com. You can also visit us on Facebook.com slash AsiaNewsline and follow us on Twitter at AsiaNewsline. That's all in tonight's edition. We will see you same time tomorrow. Good night.